الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وزدنا علما وعملا متقبلا برحمتك يا رحم الراحمين we start as we always do, first and foremost, by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We thank Him, we show Him our utmost gratitude and appreciation. We ask Allah to bless, protect, honor, and compliment our beloved Prophet, our Messenger, our role model, Muhammad Rasulullah, his family, friends, companions, and everyone that follows the way until the end of time. O Allah, include us from amongst them. O Allah, you are so perfect. We have no knowledge except for what you have taught us. So teach us those things that are beneficial to us and allow us to benefit from what you have taught us. Alhamdulillah, today we'll be finishing off the 11th chapter uh, of Riyadh al-Salihin. Again, this is a book of a hadith compiled by Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah. Imam Nawawi, he compiled this book, Riyadh al-Salihin, the gardens of the righteous, collecting and compiling a number of a hadith to, again, paint and pave the road and the steps that a believer should take as they become and try to be a better Muslim. And so we're finishing off the 11th chapter, which is on mujahada, which is on striving, struggling, putting in and exerting as much effort and energy that we have to fulfill the commandments of Allah and to make Allah happy. So the last hadith of this chapter, which is hadith number 17 of this chapter, عن سعيد بن عبد العزيز أن ربيعة بن يزيد عن أبي إدريس الخولاني عن أبي ذر جندب بن جنادة رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فيما يروي عن ربه تبارك وتعالى أنه قال we have a hadith from Abu Dhar radiallahu an, wherein he says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said فيما يروي عن الله تبارك وتعالى that what he has narrated from Allah you know, the infinitely good, the one whose blessings never stop, and the one who's infinitely, infinitely high. Again, we've seen a few of these hadith before. This we call hadith Qudsi, where it's not just the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, rather it's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam quoting Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. This could be something that Allah has told to Jibreel to tell to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It could be something that he was inspired in his heart or in a dream. And it could be that the words of this aren't necessarily supposed to be precise exact quotation from Allah. It could just be Allah said this and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is paraphrasing that idea or that concept to us. And this is different from the Quran because the Quran is meant to be recited revelation. So nobody can, and the Sahaba can differentiate because the Prophet never recited this in Salah. And he never gave this that status of what is recited in Salah. So we, sh we can't read this in Salah, but it's a, it's a different attribution than to just to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the hadith is a bit long, so we'll break it down part by part. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Allah said, Ya ibadi, inni haramtu dhulma ala nafsi wajaltuhu baynakum muharrama fala tazalamu. So the quotation here is, O oh my slaves, O oh my servants, I have made dhulm, injustice, evil, oppression. All of these things I have made haram and impermissible on myself. And I have also made it impermissible and forbidden between all of you as well. Fala tazalamu. So don't go and do dhulm to one another. Don't oppress and harm and take the rights of one another. And so first, we see that Allah is saying that I have made dhulm, oppression and wronging people haram on myself. This is a standard that Allah put on Himself. And of course, Allah with all of His infinitely beautiful and perfect names and His repeated uh, uh, reminders in the Qur'an, right? Allah doesn't do dhulm even to the tiniest thing you can imagine, the weight of the tiniest thing. And so Allah, He's saying, even if I didn't say that, I've made it haram upon myself. I am not going to do dhulm. And so there's never any scenario that we can conceive in this life or in the hereafter where Allah is doing oppression, where Allah is harming, where Allah is doing something to somebody that they don't deserve. So somebody may ask, even in this life, good people and bad people face difficulties. 
A, because Allah can do whatever He wants. If Allah makes us go through a difficulty in our life, that's not Him being unjust to us. Because He's going to compensate. If we pass that test successfully, well, He's going to reward us. And this life, again, it's not that we even own anything for us to be like, oh, you took that away from me, that was mine. Right? If, if I lose a loved one, I lose my parents, my wife, you know, my children, my family, they weren't mine for me to be like, oh Allah, you took them away from me. That was something that belonged to me and you took it away. I was like, I, I gave it to you in the first place. Your own life, I gave it to you. So dhulm in that situation is not even conceivable. And then on the day of judgment, when people are rewarded or punished for whatever they do, the good that they did, the bad that they did, these, th this is all under the justice of Allah and rather more so what we will see on the day of judgment is the rahmah and kindness of Allah. That yes, there will be people that Allah punishes and Allah gives um, uh, uh, torture and hellfire to. And again, that is because Allah made it very clear. I am your Lord, I am your master. These are the rules I gave to you. So if you are going to voluntarily disobey them, well, you knew what was coming. You had messengers come to you that warned you, if you reject me, if you disobey me, you violate my laws, well, this is what's going to happen. And the reward, on the other hand, Allah is going to do, you know, unsurmountable. And so this is, this is out of Allah's justice and out of Allah's kindness. وَجَعَلْتُهُ بَيْنَكُمْ muharrama, And I have made it impermissible between all of you. فَلَا تَظَالَمُوا So don't do ظُلْم and ظلم, like we might have mentioned before, is to put something in its improper place. Putting something where it doesn't belong. And so if we ever say a word in a situation where it doesn't belong, we take somebody's right, somebody's honor, somebody's status, somebody's money, somebody's feelings, and we put it in a place it doesn't belong, that is doing ظلم. And in this hadith specifically, the, the context is not necessarily don't do dhulm to yourself. Allah he tells us that dhulm to yourself is doing shirk. It is disobeying Allah. Right? Inna shirka la dhulmun azim. But here, the, uh, Allah and the Prophet are highlighting specifically don't do it to other people. And it becomes very easy for us to wrong and oppress other, other people. It could be people that hurt people with their tongues, with their hands. It could be people that steal other people's money. It could be oppressive leaders. It could be the police. It could be a husband to a wife. It could be a parent to a child. All of these scenarios where somebody takes the right of somebody else. And all of these things are haram. Saying something that is, is, not, is not appropriate. Right? The only time we should be yelling and criticizing somebody is if they're doing something literally wrong and haram and the context allows for that correction but if something spills if we get angry because something doesn't taste good nobody did anything wrong and so all of those statements of anger and dhulm and criticizing people all of these things are again completely haram um, and inappropriate and will be things that Allah will hold people accountable for then, and then it continues Ya ibadi kullukum dal illa man ihtadaytuhu fastahduni ahdikum O my slaves, O my servants all of you are lost you're dal, all of you are lost illa man ihtadaytuhu except for those of you whom I have guided fastahduni so ask me for guidance ahdikum and I will guide you and now here we see that guidance is a gift and a blessing from Allah and in one way, we are all dal, we're all lost. In the sense that for us to know the truth, some outside information had to come to us. And whether that be through our parents teaching us, whether that be through somebody you know, learning about the Qur'an or the Prophet online, or through the masjid, or whatever avenue, these are all ways that we found guidance. And so that one way or another, whether you make it one step or whether you make it you know, a billion steps, is going to have come from Allah. And so no human being is going to know the true worth of what is the reality of the hereafter and of Allah unless they get revelation. Yes, people can be like, there, there's probably one God, one creator. But are they going to know, hey, I need to pray five times a day? That would almost be crazy for somebody to think that. That no messenger told me, I think I should pray five times a day. How, how, do, you, how do you get that? You, you can't. 
So these are all ways and avenues that Allah guides people. That Allah gives you that information. And again, if we think about guidance, just think, you, you get lost in the freeway. You're lost, ball. So what do you do? Ask somebody, what direction do, do I need to go in? I need to get to this destination, what, how do I get there? Right? And this is what Hidayah is. Our goal and our destination is to get to Jannah to make Allah happy. So all of this information is to get us to that path. What way should we be going? فَاسْتَهْدُونِي أَهْدِكُمْ So ask me for guidance and I will guide you. Right? Ask me for guidance and I will guide you. In all, every avenue that we have, how many times do we say, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمُ Oh Allah, guide us, show us, point us to, take us to and keep us on the straight correct path. Right? Because guidance can only come from Allah. And yes, people can be guides, people can tell us the truth and information. But it, at the end of the day, it's our hearts and what Allah allows into our hearts that's going to make us guided. Because if you think about it, the people who should have been more perceptive to guidance are the likes of Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab, Abu Talib. They saw and lived with the Prophet ﷺ. We didn't. They heard the Qur'an revealed to him. He's reciting it to them. They know the language better than anybody. Who, who, who does it make more sense to, to believe? Them who were there and they saw it and they saw the miracles? Or us who have so long and these are just in, this is information coming to us? For them, it's right in front of them. But they put blocks and shackles on their heart. They are the ones that continue to say, out of their arrogance, I don't want to believe in that. I'm too good for that. This is below me. Or their sins and their evil that they do, the dhulm that they did, put walls and walls and walls in front of their heart. They could hear Qur'an, they can see the Prophet ﷺ walking. It's like, I don't care. I don't care. Because they put so much dirt, so much filth on, on their hearts. So it was actually them who just chose not to get the guidance. Ya ibadi, kullukum ja'iun illa man at'amtuhu fastat'imuni ut'imkum. That all oh, my servants, all oh, my slaves, all of you are hungry, ja'i'. You're hungry, your stomachs are empty. Illa man at'amtuhu. Except those whom I've given food. Fastat'imuni ut'imkum. Ask me for food and I will feed you. And again, now. If somebody can think, well, I, I have food in my fridge, I can literally go down the street and I can buy food. What, what do you mean, I, I'm hungry? I'm not hungry right now. Again, whether you make it one step or whether you make it one billion steps, the food came from Allah. You can look at the food that in front of you that you just ate for dinner. This came from Allah. Or if you want to go the long way, well, I had to go get a job. Allah created me, gave me the flesh and bones and I grew up to this age and gave me the mind, the energy, the intellect, the blood to even move, to go and, and to speak so I can get a job and get money. Well, the food that I'm eating, well, somebody had to go buy it and somebody had to grow it. Well, where did those seeds come from? Those seeds have been planted and come from the fruits of previous seeds, from the previous seeds of the other thing you were eating up until when? All the way up until Allah put the first bit of food on this planet. And well, where did this planet come from? The dirt, the water, all of this only came because Allah created it however long ago. So you want to go the short way? Allah gave it to me. You want to go the long way? Allah created the entire universe. There would be no food without Allah. So one way or another, it came to me from Him and Him alone. So ask me for food and I will give it to you. And again, that doesn't mean, you know, you go home and you ask, you know, your, your, your parents, your wife, your children, hey, I'm hungry, get me something. There's nothing wrong with that. But as long as we recognize, when I ask, you know, if I go home and I, and I say, hey, you know, I want something to eat. I'm not, me asking that person for food, my wife, my mom for food, is not like the way I make dua to Allah for food. Because I know the food isn't coming from them. Nobody opens the fridge and says, SubhanAllah, this fridge made the food. <laughs> Nobody does that, right? Because you know that food came from somewhere, from somewhere, from somewhere, from somewhere. So there's nothing wrong with asking for food and, and things like that. At the end of the day, we know it all came from Allah. 
And so a part of this is not just, oh Allah, give me food. It's, oh Allah, make that food something that's going to be beneficial for me. I mean, that keeps me healthy. Something that doesn't ruin my stomach. Something that removes the hunger from my body. Right? Because a lot of people eat. But the hunger and the desire doesn't go from their body. Ya ibadi, kullukum aarin illa man kasawtuhu fastaksuni aksukum. That, oh my servants, oh my slaves, all of you are naked. You don't have clothes. You don't have protection. Accept those whom I give clothing to. So ask me for clothing and I will give you clothing. Again, same thing as before. You can make it one step. I went to the store and I bought this. Or all of this fabric had to come from somewhere. From the earth, from the animals, from this, from that, until the world, entire universe was created. Right? Ask Allah for clothing. And again, you can go to the store, you can ask for clothing. But at the end of the day, no one recognized it came from Allah. And again, these two of food and clothing... Right? There are some people who have more clothing, some people who have less clothing. This is another way for Allah to highlight Inna Allah min ibadihi wa yaqdirullah. Allah can give some people an absolute abundance. Some people have more clothes than there are days in their life. And some people will have one or two garments like the Prophet ﷺ. So again, this getting of food and clothing is just how Allah does things and it's not a sign of Him doing dhulb or not. It's just, he chooses and whatever it is, that's what it is. Because it's his choice. Ya ibadi, innakum tukhti'una bil-layli wal-nahar wa ana aghfiru al-dhunuba jami'a fastaghfiruni aghfir lakum. O my servants, O my slaves, all of you tukhti'un, all of you are committing sins, you're doing things that are wrong, you're making mistakes day and night. Every day, every night. But, wa ana aghfiru al-dhunuba jami'a. But I forgive all sins, every category, any type of sin. Ask me for forgiveness and I will forgive you. Right? And as human beings, we're all going to do something wrong. None of us have not done something wrong. Right? The second we hit puberty, the second we become adults in the sight of Allah, we're, we've all done something wrong. But Allah has not made this deen, this religion, this way of life something that's miserable. You do something wrong? Say astaghfirullah, Allah I'm sorry, oh, Allah forgive me, Allah I'm turning back to you in repentance. Whatever mistake that we do, as long as we sincerely come back to Allah, oh Allah I'm sorry, I will try my best not to do it again, then Allah will forgive. Then Allah will forgive. Right? The only caveat is somebody who chose and knowingly rejected the truth and then they died on that kufr. Said, I know there's one true God, I'm not going to believe. Then what hope do you have when you die on that and then you're standing in front of Allah? Even people that make mistakes in this life, you, you may, maybe you took something, you said something wrong, maybe even you, you, know, you missed a prayer, you missed a fast, something. And you didn't do istighfar for in this life. Allah can still forgive things like that even on the day of judgment. He's not going to let go of people who choose knowingly, I don't want to worship you. Right? So everything else Allah will forgive. Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'a. Right? Um, and the next line. Ya ibadi innakum lan tabluhu dharri fatadurruni wa lan tabluhu naf'i fatanfa'uni. O my slaves, O my servants, you will never come close to my harm so that you would ever actually be able to harm me. And you will never even come close to, be to my benefit so that you could even ever benefit me. And the words here is dhurri and naf'i. You would think it's, you would never be able to harm me. This is Allah saying, my harm and my benefit. As if to say like, there is nothing that can harm me. There is nothing that can benefit me. The, this, these notions don't exist with Allah that somebody can do something to harm Allah. Or do something to benefit or help Allah. That concept doesn't exist. How do you hurt the one who is beyond everything who is subhan who is ta'al and how do you benefit you can't you can't go to Allah and take and there's nothing for you to take from him because he doesn't need anything there's nothing you can give to him because he doesn't need anything right and Allah is far beyond whatever we can even imagine to, to, to do to or for or against him 
And then Allah, he highlights this point. Ya ibadi, law anna awwalakum wa akhirakum wa insakum wa jinnakum kanu ala atqa qalbi rajulin wahidin minkum ma zada thalika fi mulki shay'a. Oh my slaves, oh my servants, if the first of all of you and the last of all of you, the first being ever created until the last being ever created from the humans and the jinn, if all of you كانوا على أتقى قلب رجل واحد. If all of you were to be the best Muslims, you had the most taqwa in your hearts. If everybody was a Muslim, every human being, every jinn was a Muslim like the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, absolute best. It, it it doesn't increase in Allah's kingdom. It doesn't increase in Allah's power in Allah's control at all. Why? Because Allah made all of us. And Allah doesn't, it, Allah doesn't need our worship or our ibadah. Allah doesn't need it. If all of us were to be born and do sajda until we die with the most sincerity in our heart, so what? It, is, it doesn't make a difference. Allah doesn't need that at all. Yes, He asked us to do it, and so we do it. But He doesn't need it at all. Right? And then he does says the opposite. Ya ibadi law anna awalakum wa akhirakum wa insakum wa jinnakum kanu ala afjari qalbi rajun wahid minkum ma naqasa thalika fi mulki shay'a. And if all of you, first and last, humans and jinn, were to be the worst heart, the most evil person, the most wretched person, it wouldn't diminish anything from my kingdom, my power, my control at all. Again, because Allah made all of us. What difference does it make if people believe or they don't believe it? It doesn't have an impact on Allah. Allah was still Allah before He created everything. And Allah will still be Allah after He destroys everything. Whether He lets people live or die, it doesn't make a difference. Even if, if whether Allah only made Jannah, would it matter? If Allah only made Jahannam, it doesn't matter. These are all His creations. And He does whatever He wants. Right? If everybody was to be like Iblis or Fir'aun or Abu Jahl, okay, so what? يا عبادي لو أن أولكم وآخركم وإنسكم وجنكم قاموا في صعيد واحد فسألوني فأعطيت كل إنسان مسألة ما نقص ذلك مما عندي إلا كما ينقص المخيط إذا أدخل البحر. Oh my servants, my slaves, if again the first of you, the last of you, every jinn, every human being. If all of you were to stand together in one place, all of you were together, and all of you asked me for whatever you wanted, everything you wanted, and I gave all of you everything you wanted, it wouldn't decrease what I have even in the slightest. And he gives an example, like when you take, entire, they take the entire ocean, you put a needle in there, you take out the needle. What came out? Nothing. If I were to give every one of you everything, right? And even, even imagine if Allah gave everybody else some other precious commodity. If we all got gold, well, gold is going to be useless. But you get a billion things of gold. You get a billion things of this. You get a billion things. Like everybody has everything they want. Everybody's in Jannah. Everybody gets their own Jannah. What difficulty is it for Allah to say, kun kun bi, and it is you get whatever? There's nothing. And that doesn't decrease anything Allah has even in the slightest. And even in this hadith, what does it say? L like, like the needle if it's brought out. Nobody should think that, oh, one drop came out so it did remove something. This is just done as what? An example. Because at the end of the day, did it even remove one drop from Allah, what Allah has? No. No. And, and, and again, this is because Allah he is completely independent. He is completely self-sufficient. He doesn't need anything to begin with. So He can give however He wants and it's not going to remove anything from Him. And the last line here, يَا عِبَادِي إِنَّمَا هِيَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ أُحْصِيهَا عَلَيْكُمْ ثُمَّ أُوَفِّيكُمْ إِيَّاهَا Oh my servants, oh my slaves, at the end of the day, it's just your actions that I'm counting, that I'm recording. And I will repay you and give you the full account. فَمَنْ وَجَدَ خَيْرًا فَلْيَحْمَدِ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ وَجَدَ غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ فَلَا يَلُومَنَّ إِلَّا نَفْسَهِ So whoever finds good, well then thank Allah, be grateful to Allah, praise Allah. And whoever finds other than that, and you don't find good, you have nobody to blame but yourself. Right? If you think about the good here, فَمَنْ وَجَدَ خَيْرًا right? if, you, if you're finding good, in that now you're being repaid with good. 
right? You, you worshipped, you believed, you did good deeds in this life and in Jannah now you're getting reward, you're getting blessings. Or it could be in this life, you find guidance, you are a good Muslim, you're trying, you know, you're, 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 you're somebody that prays and you enjoy being a good Muslim. Then either situation, thank Allah. These are blessings and favors from Allah. He guided you, so ask Him for more guidance. He kept your heart clean so that you can accept guidance. So keep thanking Him for that. And if you find evil, it could be that you find yourself in Jahannam, in hellfire. Or you find yourself in this life, rejecting the truth, committing evil, doing sins, doing dhulm. You have nobody to blame but yourself. Because if when we do wrong, it's our choice at the end of the day. Fir'aun, Iblis, Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab, they saw the truth. And it was their own actions that chose to reject. It was because of their ignorance, their arrogance, their hatred, their evil that they did their whole life that put these walls and barriers in front of them. So you have nobody to blame but yourself. So may Allah make us people who, who are truly guided, who get guidance from Allah, we seek you know, food from Allah, we seek clothing from Allah, and all of these things, you know, may Allah bless us, and may Allah allow us to have mujahada, to strive and to struggle and give our 110% for His sake. Ameen. So we finished chapter 11 today. Um, the next few chapters are a little bit shorter. The next few chapters are about doing good at the end of your life. And then all of the different ways to do good, right? You have praying, you have zakah, you have character, you have doing hajj, you have so many different ways of what we can do good. And then the next one after that is, we know all of these things, how do we have balance in the good deeds that we do? If you're just like, alright, I'm just going to read Quran until I pass out. Okay, that's not sustainable. Right, so how do we have balance and make it a part of our daily lives? So you know, we'll continue this again every first Tuesday, every, the first Tuesday every month, inshallah. Subhanallah, bihamdihi, subhanallah, al-azim. Subhanak Allah, bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Sallallahu ta'ala ala khair khalqi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsan illa umidin wa jami'ahum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We went a little bit longer today because it was one long hadith, but inshallah in the future we'll keep it to right around 15, 20 minutes. Assalamu alaykum.